Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. More than 1.3 million Texans have filed for unemployment since mid-March. But the number of people out of work since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic is likely much higher. Dylan Collier spoke to one man who's been in the pending claim category for six weeks. After being laid off from his job at a shoe boutique at La Quintera Mall the middle of last month, Michael Ibarra said he did everything right, submitting his application for unemployment online to the Texas Workforce Commission. But six weeks... There was actually one day where I called 90 times. And now countless attempts to follow up later... <laughs> Ibarra hasn't received a dime and has only been told the state is still reviewing his claim. No issues telling me why. It's under review or what can I do to help myself? Nothing. Phone calls unanswered. No luck on the Internet. Even the career centers visited by Ibarra have been shut down. It makes me feel like, I, like I've done something wrong, you know, and with bills coming up next month and, and rent due at the end of the week, it's kind of hard, it's stressful for me right now. Reached for comment today, a spokeswoman for the Texas Workforce Commission asked for Ibarra's contact information and said he doesn't need to do anything but be patient. Ibarra's patience, like his money, could soon run out. Necessities is what I need and um, I'd like to them to get back to me and let me know what I've done or what I can do to get this resolved. Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. State officials say it is taking 21 days and beyond for residents to collect benefits if they've been told they qualify. 1,313, that is the number of calls San Antonio police say they've received for social distancing related violations since the city's emergency declaration went into effect. The problem? Some of those calls came in through 911, which should only be used for emergencies. Devin Clark explains how to properly report social distancing violations and how not doing so affects public safety. When it comes to calling law enforcement for social distancing violations, some on social media were strongly in favor, while others were opposed. San Antonio police officer Doug Green says while it is important to practice social distancing and abide by the city's stay home work safe order, you shouldn't call 911 on those who don't. We want to remind people that 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 911 is a is for emergencies. If you are in the uh, immediate dire need of the uh, of, of services of the 1313 emergency declaration violation calls SAPD received green says some were made to 911 which causes a bigger issue but when you call uh, 911 for something that is very uh, uh, minute uh, it is kind of setting us back on trying to get the resources to the people who really need it immediately. In some cases, calling 911 for non-emergencies could come with penalties. On the other hand, Green isn't saying that emergency declaration violations shouldn't be reported at all. Uh, but we do have the non-emergency number, which is 210207-SAPD, uh, which we would prefer people to utilize that number. We'll post that number on our website, ksat.com. And also for those of you out there who would like to keep track of calls coming into officials regarding emergency declaration violations, we'll have information on how to look at that on ksat.com as well. Devin Clark, KSAT 12 News. All right, we want to take you to some breaking news right now. Sky 12 over the scene of what they're calling a structure fire, but it does seem to be a residential home uh, at, in the 12,800 block of Terrytown. We're told the call came out about 30 minutes ago at 530. Yeah, and it, what we know is this is up north of I-35 inside Loop 1604 in the Valley Forge area of town. Again, the northeast side, get a better vantage point here as Sky 12 kind of swoops around to get out of the smoke a little bit. It is a large structure. Uh, I, you know, it's hard to tell. It looks like it's what's left of a house there to the left of the screen. It does not look like there's much left. Cannot tell if it's spread to other structures again. This is the 12,800 block of Terrytown. Trying to get a better look if we're looking at an apartment complex here or exactly what we're looking at. You can't really see, but you can see flames 
coming out of the roof of one of these structures. Yeah, here. but nonetheless, uh, fire crews are there on the scene, and they seem to have a pretty good handle on it because it's mostly smoke at this point. But as you can see, the whole roof on the left side of that structure is completely uh, blown out. So uh, again, 12,800 block of Terrytown on the northeast side. We will continue to monitor the situation out there. Yeah, you see the two driveways so close. Maybe some townhomes. Uh, we continue to monitor, but the two very two structures very close to one another. That's for sure. Governor Greg Abbott has released his plans to reopen Texas. This includes opening retail shops, restaurants and movie theaters. They have the clear to open on Friday, but with no more than 25% occupancy. Also given the clear to open dentist offices. Stephanie Cerna talked with a local dentist about his plans to reopen staff. Well, Steve, I talked with Dr. Willie Cantu, who owns Smile Solutions on Northwest Military, and he says the governor's announcement today was welcome news, but that it's going to be a little bit of a process to open back up. Now, he says that they probably won't start seeing patients until Monday and that they will use Friday to get ready. He says they will need to go over their supplies of personal protection equipment to make sure they have everything they need, and they will probably use the parking lot as their virtual waiting room to keep that social distancing. And, uh, you know, uh, today it was welcome news, but we'll have to certainly take baby steps to kind of get back started again because it's uh, it's uh, it's been a bit. Yeah. And we got to get uh, a lot of folks in and hopefully everybody remains patient and, and understanding that we're we're trying to work through, you know, um, some real difficult times with uh, with keeping everybody safe while still trying to treat patients. And Dr. Willie Cantu also says he understands that there will be some patients and some staff members that may not be comfortable going back, and that's okay. But he says he's ready to go back to work, and they will start operating in a way to keep his patients safe and his staff. Steve Isis. Thank you, Stephanie. The pandemic has forced us to make some major changes in our plans, among them those that have wedding plans. Paul Venema reports that instead of big ceremonies, many couples are settling for a simple courthouse wedding. Empty hallways are the norm here as a result of the pandemic. Courtrooms are empty since many judges are conducting hearings remotely. But there have been some exceptions. Case in point, a recent morning in Judge Velia Meza's courtroom. Hi, Crystal. Take you, Michael. We did have other plans. It wasn't exactly what we planned, but it's something we definitely wanted to do. Michael Bragg and his fiance Crystal's other plans did not include a courthouse wedding. They were going to do something big. After they started limiting the amount of people gathering, we said, well, we'll, we'll have to do it later. And then we just decided to go ahead and do it right now. The way many other couples have been doing when the pandemic restrictions were put in place, license in hand, they headed to the courthouse. It was just a lucky thing that we had a judge here that, that would do it. As for their other plans? We're still going to have a ceremony and a celebration when things clear up. Um, and in the meantime, I get to be married to this guy, so pretty excited about that. Congratulations, you may kiss the bride. From all appearances, she's not the only one who's excited. I'm happy. <laughs> Paul Venema, Case at 12 News. All right, let's take a look at the roadways this evening. With your time saver traffic, you're looking at a shot of I-10 and Frio, where as you can see, things are slow going. Of course, with the governor's orders to reopen starting this Friday, perhaps uh, this will change in the weeks to come. It'll be an interesting thing mm -hmm. to keep note of. Well, new at six, though she lost her own battle, Taylor Castro is still fighting cancer. Tomorrow marks a year since the local mother of three died following a fight with acute myeloid leukemia. But as Garrett Berger tells us, her legacy lives on in the thousands of people she's inspired to help patients like her. Even as she waited for a matching donor to provide the peripheral blood stem cell transplant that was her best chance for a cure, Taylor Castro was thinking of others. If we can't find my match, but we can find for somebody else, that's... It really is good enough for me. Though Castro was unable to get the life-saving donation she needed in time, she has helped give better odds to patients like her, inspiring more than 6,200 people to sign up for the National Marrow Donor Program, ready to give their bone marrow or stem cells to people fighting blood cancers or other blood diseases. So that is fully committed. Like, they finished their profile, they did their swabs, their testing is done. They are on the list waiting to be called. Her mother, Naomi Herrera, is a senior manager at GenCure's Apheresis Center, where people donate the very kind of stem cells Castro needed. So I just show them a picture of Taylor's, like, you need to see somebody who you're helping, this is what they 
look like. And someday, maybe one of those people Castro inspired to become donors will be in one of these chairs, saving someone else's life because of her. Oh, I can't wait till that day happens, and it hopefully happens this year. In the meantime, Herrera's hoping even more people sign up for the donor program and complete the registration process. So when someone like her daughter gets sick, there will be a donor ready to be called upon. Tomorrow, on the anniversary of Castro's death, her mother is asking supporters to wear their Team Taylor t-shirts and take a picture and tag the Team Taylor Facebook page. I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Take a live look outside with live cam right now, 87 degrees. It is warming up, Adam. Oh, it sure is. We've got that bright sunshine out there right now. Still monitoring a little bit of activity on the radar far to the west of town in the off chance a few showers can make it here later this evening. It'd be nice if they did. Aquifer down a full foot today, and we're just barely above average. I mean, by just two tenths of a foot. Mold, grass, pecan, oak, all reported, but low today in the pollen count. Temperatures right now, for the most part, mid and upper 80s. Divine's at 91, Pleasant in 86, even 81 in Canyon Lake, but 85 in Holotus. As we go through the evening, some increasing clouds, slight chance, 20% chance of an isolated shower. Incre the humidity is increasing. We'll have some fog and a cold front to talk about coming up. All families are struggling. Now imagine being the parents of a child with special needs. Hear about their unique challenges tonight. And we are standing by right now for the uh, daily COVID-19 briefing by our city mayor and county judge. Let's go ahead and listen in. District Attorney Joe Gonzalez. This is our COVID-19 update for San Antonio. Tonight we have 1,275 total cases of COVID-19 in our community. That's up modestly from yesterday. We're holding steady at 42% of cases recovered. 700 people tonight are still fighting the virus in our community, and we do have one new death to report. Unfortunately, a Hispanic woman in her 70s with underlying health conditions. Our hospital figures still continue to grow, be strong. We have 59 COVID positive patients in the hospital, with another 39 being investigated as potentially having COVID-19 and they're waiting test results. Um, and we have 34 patients now on, in ICU, 16 on ventilators. Now, the big news of today, obviously, was Governor Abbott uh, issued a new executive order, order number 18, as well as order number 19 for the state of Texas. Um, it obviously uh, makes some changes to the way we've been operating through the COVID-19 crisis response throughout the state of Texas. As you've been listening to these updates throughout the month, uh, the judge and I have been talking about our numbers, talking about our interventions, the things that we've been doing together as a community to flatten the curve and save lives. And it is very clear and it is evident through the numbers, the data, and the lives saved that we have been doing a good job with that. We've made a tremendous difference in containing the coronavirus from becoming worse in our community than it already has been. So I wanna thank you for that, number one. The second thing I'll tell you is that in the order of the governor, it creates a new category of businesses called reopened businesses. Some of those, uh, some of those operations that had been shut down previously as a result of stay home work safe orders. Um, those are effectively uh, opened in stages, of course, underpinned by public health guidance. But I will tell you, the judge and I will be uh, talking with our city council and the commissioner's court tomorrow at a meeting at one o'clock to work through the public health guidance that we'll be receiving tomorrow. And we will be issuing new stay home work safe orders that are in compliance with the work that we've been doing here locally, but also recognizing this new category of businesses so that we can continue to proceed through the next month and more with uh, a containment of this virus to make sure that we open safely and effectively. This is critically important. The social distancing that you've been practicing, the wearing of masks, the work that we're doing to limit public gatherings is why we have been able to save lives. Don't stop doing that. We are not through with this virus and this virus is not through with us. And so the work that we'll continue to do over the next several weeks is critically important to keeping us safe. Judge? Yeah, thanks, Mayor. Uh, I'll start out by saying I think that the uh, governor made the right call in opening uh, restaurants, uh, retail, malls, and movie. Uh, with the fact that only one fourth of the occupancy can come to those, I think I think that's a good decision. But 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 uh, there's a lot of reservations about how it will be done. 
Uh, number one, I think that the uh, worst uh, decision he made uh, was to not require mandatory use of face mask. Uh, to me, that is the underpinning of everything we do, face mask or covering, uh, six, six foot social distancing, uh, washing the hands, all those sort of washing down services. Uh, so I thought that was a mistake. I hope that I uh, believe under the order we'll be able to continue to make it mandatory, and, and, and I think that's what we'll be reviewing in the next few days. He really didn't address the stay at home, work safe, other than the fact that, well, it'd be nice if you can do it. Uh, we will be working on an order that will stay in compliance with what the um, governor is doing, but in other instances, uh, uh, a, a mandatory order to keep people at home unless they go out for one of the preliminary things that, that, that have been okayed and would start this, um, start this, coming, um, this coming Friday. Uh, one of the other issues he allowed was the opening of libraries and in, um, in museums uh, subject to local order. I hope we're able to get Bibliotech open sometime next week and begin to offer those services again to our to our constituents. Um, another thing happened today that was a bit disturbing, and I don't have all the facts on it yet, but I believe it happened at the Almas Club Apartments on 800 Bassey that uh, some 50 people were locked out of their apartments, and I think we've got a lot of calls with respect to that. Uh, I'm telling you right now, we're going to continue to put in place uh, the uh, no evictions. Now, this is the first really flagrant violation we've had of that, and um, we've asked the district attorney and other law enforcement to look into it and see what kind of options that we may have against the company that did that. That was an unfortunate thing to happen in a very terrible way to do that, to come home and find you've been locked out of your home and very, very disturbing, and we're going to do everything we can to, 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 to correct that. Uh, this is a book of protocols that the governor has put out uh, retaining uh, some of the health issues that would be required. When we get our report tomorrow from our local health committee, we'll be kind of meshing that with this and seeing if there's any other protocols that maybe were not in here that we need to continue to do. Uh, I would say the one one thing on restaurants, I, I really don't know that they're going to be able to open with only one-fourth of capacity. I believe Bayless Miller had a much better plan than came out with respect to restaurants. His was where only two people could be at a table, where they had to be six foot apart, where they had to wear a mask when they were coming in, having to clean the table. He, he really laid out some wonderful protocols, I thought. Uh, so uh, we'll be looking at some of the safeguards that probably ought to go in with that. But uh, we want to make sure that this works. Uh, we know he'll be going to a second phase on May the 18th. We want to be supportive. We want to make sure it works. But we want to put in place all the safeguards we can possibly put in to make sure it does work. Thank you, Judge. And, and so to emphasize, the world did not suddenly change with respect to this infection uh, today. Uh, some orders did change from the state, but what is working is social distancing, wearing masks, making sure that we're limiting public gatherings. The things that we've been doing as a community here locally and across the state and all the major metros have been working to help us contain this disease. That work will continue, so please help us with that. And um, we, were he we are here to answer any questions, but I do want to remind folks, if you want to get the latest on COVID-19 in our community, you can text COSAGOV to 55000 or you can go to sanantonio.gov slash COVID-19. And so we'll go to questions now. Going back to the mask. All right, that's an update from the mayor and the county judge talking about that we are up to 1,275, 1,275 total cases of COVID. They did have one more death today, uh, meaning 44. And uh, the mayor went on to thank the community for their efforts in public health. Uh, he said that they will be issuing a new stay home work safe order in conjunction with the uh, county commissioners. They're actually having a joint meeting for the first time, I believe, in history that they've ever had that at the Witte Museum, where they are going to have a joint meeting where they talk about where do we go from here, especially in conjunction with the new uh, emergency declaration, emergency orders that the governor's office put out. Today. Yeah, and as you heard him say there, they will be in compliance with those governor's order. The judge just making it really clear that he does agree with, and he thought this was the right call for the governor to make, but that also there are some reservations. One of them, the big one, him pointing out and straight up calling it a mistake, was that these orders no longer require face masks, and he hinted at 
that the order would possibly have something in there that will continue to make it mandatory, at least here locally. He seemed to indicate, the county judge being, that they think that they can implement their own order and that that order would have something to do with masks and face coverings. Stay tuned on that. Yeah. We'll have to see whether uh, how that is interpreted. I'm sure that, uh, you know, it could be a legal battle that's coming up, but the county judge indicating he thinks they can do that. Also interesting, the county judge calling out an apartment complex by name, the Almost Club Apartments on Bassey Road, saying 50 people were locked out of their apartments today, basically evicted because they didn't pay, and that is contrary to the city and the county's no eviction policy. Also be interesting to see how that plays out, but he said certainly not a good way to come home from wherever you are and find out that you've been locked out of your apartment. So, All right, now let's turn out of weather. It's 87 degrees out there, Adam. Yeah, we 90 degrees earlier today, so it's another warm one, but we're used to that around here. It's not a big deal. Overall, beautiful day, bright sunshine. It wasn't too humid until later this evening and tonight. That humidity is going to store. So let's take a look at our weather headlines. And yes, very humid to tonight and especially tomorrow with a foggy start today. That humidity is going to lead to some areas of fog and some limited visibility if you're on the roadways first thing tomorrow morning. Cold front's going to pay us a, vid on, a, a visit on Wednesday. That's going to drop the humidity for the latter half of the week, make us or give us some comfortable mornings and make it pretty comfortable out there for the latter half of the week. Slight chance of storms with all this happening and all the changes on the way. 85 in Pleasanton, 82 in Kerrville, we're 93 in Del Rio. 91 now in Carrizo Springs. Looking at the radar, we have a bit of activity out west and especially across the border. There's a slight chance one or two of these storms could uh, really hang together and move eastward and about a 20% chance of that even making it to the I-35 corridor. So just something we're watching, but I don't really plan on us seeing much in terms of any rainfall anytime soon. Morning fog tomorrow, so that overall dampness to start the day. 71 in the morning, near 90 again into the afternoon with some sunshine later in the day. But you're going to notice that thick humidity. That's for sure. It is going to be muggy out there. And here's a look at the seven day forecast. I mean, we get into Wednesday. We start the day with the cold front moving in. A few isolated showers and storms possible. Windy day, then lower humidity. Mornings in the 50s by Thursday and Friday. Some beautiful days to end the week. Thank you, Adam. Greg has sports next. So I called my agent and Irving Wiener said, yes, it's a done deal, George. I'm going to fly you into San Antonio. You know, you, you are now a San Antonio Spur. He is one of the greatest all-time Spurs. He's a legend in the NBA. Happy birthday to the Iceman, George Gervin, who turns 68 today in big board sports. But first... On the heels of Governor Greg Abbott's announcement today to reopen Texas during the COVID-19 pandemic, the Spurs will be one of the early benefactors of that decision. The NBA announcing today that training facilities in states not under the further restrictions like Texas can reopen as early as next Friday, May the 8th. Players can report on a voluntary basis. No group workouts will be allowed, but the facilities will be open. One thing the league officials are cautious about is not giving any teams a leg up on a possible return to play. The Spurs have not suited up on the court since their 119-109 victory back on March the 10th, missed a total of 19 games before the playoffs were set to begin last weekend. There has already been a report that it would take at least 25 days to restart the league, but the first step would be getting the players back into the facilities for individual workouts. The Los Angeles Lakers received over four and a half million dollars from the federal government, which was intended to help small businesses survive during the COVID-19 pandemic and ultimate shutdowns. The Lakers, one of the most high profile and profitable franchises in the NBA, did apply for relief through the Small Business Administration's Paycheck Protection Program. But after reports got out that large companies and businesses were receiving part of the program's $349 billion pool, rather than thousands of small businesses, the Lakers decided to return Turn the money. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. The Houston Texans receiving high marks in their first draft for Bill O'Brien as the team's new general manager and head coach. His game plan was to bolster his defense after being run out of the playoffs by the Kansas City Chiefs after being up by 24 points. His first pick had to be in the second round after trading the first round selection for offensive tackle Laramie Tunsil last year, and he chose defensive tackle Ross Blacklock out of TCU to replace nose tackle DJ Reader, who the Texans lost to the Bengals in free agency. O'Brien also used one of two. 
fourth round picks to select cornerback John Reed from Penn State, who had 125 tackles and seven interceptions in four seasons for the Nittany Lions, looking for death of that position after saying goodbye to 14-year veteran Jonathan Joseph. For O'Brien and Reed, it's a reunion. I've known John for a while. When I was at Penn State, he was a sophomore in high school and came to our camp, and I think we offered him a scholarship right there. Um, really smart guy, comes from a great family. Um, but I think he can, yeah, I think he can do both. I think he can play on the inside, and I also think that uh, he'll help us on special teams, you know. So I, th I thought we, that was a really, another guy that we felt really good about that we had targeted and we were really hoping would be there, and he, and he was there. All right, for Reed, who says he has been staying in shape during the COVID-19 pandemic by using his dad's best friend's barbell set, was asked what it was like being recruited by O'Brien in college and now being drafted by the same man in the pros. I had a, a few conversations with him uh, when I was being uh, recruited, just when I was on campus and things like that. Um, and I just heard all the respect uh, that the players had for him because um, there were still a lot of players there that, were, that had been coached by him when I came in as a freshman. All they ever spoke about was you know, just the respect uh, that he had for, for all the players and how much they liked him. And coming up tonight on the Night Beat, the additional restrictions the NBA has placed on teams when these facilities do reopen a week from this Friday. All right. Thank you, Greg. We'll be right back after this. Welcome back, and this is a segment in the show called Coronavirus Q&A. And a lot of people today are obviously talking about the, the governor mm -hmm. reopening the state of Texas, but schools stay closed in all of this. And we are joined by Dr. Mike Villarreal from UTSA's Urban Education Institute. Of course, he was a state rep for 15 years, then decided to uh, go back to school, I guess we could say, and become a doctor, get his doctorate. So Dr. Mike Villarreal joins us from UTSA's Urban Education Institute. Thank you for, for being here, Mike. Glad to join you. And, and Dr. Villarreal, I want to start by asking you, first of all, can you tell us what exactly is UTSA's Urban Education Institute? Just tell us a little bit about uh, what it is and what you do. We do applied research. We focus on the Bear County community of schools and students. Uh, we work with education leaders to figure out what's working in education for which students and under what, what circumstances are uh, education services working best. And, and so we uh, follow students over their lifetime. We have uh, uh, data uh, that's collected from our public schools, TEA and the Higher Coordinating Board that allow us to, to evaluate what's working. So we, you know, we're talking, we talk about the digital divide. We talk about uh, kids that don't have uh, access to broadband internet. The, the question that I think begs to be answered in all of this, uh, doctor, is are we talking about a lost generation? Are we talking about kids out there who aren't going to have the foundation to move forward to the next grade or to move on to college? I mean, we were talking about algebra, biology, any of these things. Are you concerned you know, it, about it, that? Um, I, I don't think we're going to have a lost generation. But this certainly is going to impact the learning trajectory of our students, and it's going to impact them in, in different ways. So some students who are perfectly equipped at their home, who do not have any pressure to, to go get a job, um, who can just focus on reading books and connecting with their teachers online, it, they're, they're going to continue to, to learn. I think this event creates a, a real speed bump for all of the other students. And we're hoping to help our schools understand how this event is impacting our students in different ways. Uh, so we're launching a, a survey research project where we're going to be calling students on the phone and their parents and teachers to ask them a series of questions to collect data to understand how this distance learning program is being experienced by our young people, by their parents and, and by our teachers. In the end, what we hope to do is answer these kind of questions of you know, how much of an impact, how much of a hit did this event have on our students, which students got hurt most, uh, what is distance learning good for, what is it not? Uh, if we have to come back to it, how can we design lessons uh, and, and our education experience online in a more effective way. 
Now, Dr. Villarreal, you know, the pandemic has affected families in different ways because all families come from different socioeconomic backgrounds. Can you talk to us about what you're seeing in terms of that divide here locally? Well, let me just give you one example. Um, a student who participated in, a, in an interview with one of our researchers uh, shared that she's working 10 to 11 hour shifts at Bill Miller's. And she's able to do that because she doesn't go to school um, during the day. You know, the learning is now not tied to, you know, the eight to three o'clock time clock. Uh, she can do her learning independently. Now, is it uh, the same quality of learning? Maybe not, um, but here's a young person who has a need uh, to earn money for herself and possibly for her, her, her parents who, who may be impacted by this shutdown. And so that's just one example of a person who is living a very different life than she was prior to COVID-19. Are some of these students just going to learn differently at home than they are in a classroom? Uh, absolutely. And, and, you know, so are the adults. You know, all of us are having to really get familiar with the software products that have been living on our computers for some time now. We're, we, after this event, we're all going to be a whole lot more familiar with navigating these kind of, you know, teleconferencing, video conferencing sessions. And, and I think we can expect distance learning to some degree to continue. Uh, there are places for it that we're, we're learning. Uh, we, we're discovering that some students really like the idea of being able to go at their own pace and accelerate and not have to work and collaborate with their, their classmates if they don't need to. If they want to, they can choose to. Uh, this new technology is allowing us to, to really expand the experience. And, and so we need to, to learn from it and get better at delivering this kind of opportunity going forward. Of course, that was Dr. Mike Villarreal, the director of the UTSA Urban Education Institute. Dr. Villarreal, thank you so much for your time. And we'll talk My to you pleasure. tonight at 9. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. We'll be right back. The coronavirus seemingly not having an effect on the drug trade, but South Texas Border Patrol agents are. Several busts over the weekend totaling about $2 million worth of marijuana. About a quarter of that coming in yesterday. Agents with the Rio Grande City Station spotting a speeding SUV along Highway 83. The suspected smuggler ditched that SUV, left behind the pot about 460 pounds. Other seizures this weekend in the cities of Roma, Escobaras, La Grulla, Salineno, added up about 2,000 pounds. All right, let's turn now to weather. A very nice 87 degrees out there, and we are uh, finishing off oh, what was just a dreamy weekend. It, it was, was great. Yes. Oh, and perfect weather this weekend. It's that lack of humidity in the air that was so nice, and we you know, didn't have the um, high heat that we had to round out last work week, Friday. 98. That was the hottest we've been so far this year. So yeah, that was a toasty one. 87 outside right now. And as we go through the evening, we'll see those temperatures falling down into the 70s. But with higher humidity tonight, it's going to be a little bit warmer tomorrow morning. Low 70s and then muggy, some areas of fog and those low clouds to start the day. We'll talk more about a cold front that's going to head our way, what that means for rain chances and the rest of the week coming up. All right, time now to talk a little weather. Absolutely. Talk about how nice it was. And, you know, I find when I take vacation off the same time, take a day off the same time as the weather people, it usually works oh. out. <laughs> Maybe they know something there. I don't know. It did, but Lucky it was, a, you. It was yeah. a great weekend. Yeah. Collusion. <laughs> That's the word. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was a wonderful weekend that we had. And you know, it's that time of year where you get such beautiful days. And we're going to see more of that later on this week. But we have some changes to go through before we get there. So first, let's take a look at our day today. We topped out at 90 degrees and you see some of those clouds starting to stream overhead. We're getting some of the blow off cloud cover from some of the storms far to the west of us right now. Morning of 61 was exactly average. Afternoon of 90, seven degrees above average, but the record 99 set back in 2014. Right now we're sitting at 87 degrees. A dew point is 62, which is up quite a bit from the past couple of days. You look at the 24 hour dew point change and it's about 10 to 20 degrees higher now 
you know, than, than this time yesterday. The winds out of the south at 20. It's been uh, kicking up here and there throughout the day today. So you've noticed some gusts and that's helping to boost that humidity. All right, temperatures right now for the most part in the 80s. We've got 89 New Braunfels, 85 Pleasanton, Bandera, you're at 83 degrees, then just a few lower 90s southwest of town where it's typically a little bit warmer. Del Rio, for example, at 93. So let's talk, talk about the dew points and how muggy it's feeling outside. It was good over the weekend. Today, though, the wind turned southeasterly and that boosted these dew point numbers. So we're back in the mug muggy category. It's not all that bad, though. It's going to become much more noticeable through the night. Here's our future cast and by tomorrow morning. First thing. Yeah, very thick humidity. I think we'll have dew points around 70 degrees and likely in the low 70s and that's going to stay all the way through Wednesday morning. So even look at 10 AM Wednesday, just thick humidity, very muggy out there, but the wind's going to start shifting northerly on Wednesday because of a cold front and that's going to get rid of the humidity. Give us some drier air for the latter half of the work week. Now the importance of this isn't just that it's going to feel better and more comfortable outside, but this also leads to cooler mornings. So by Thursday and Friday mornings, we're looking at low temperatures, probably down in the 50s. Here's a look at that dew point tracker. Tomorrow, very muggy. By Wednesday, we'll see that drop later in the day, setting the stage for much more comfortable and uh, very pleasant conditions Thursday and Friday before that humidity returns for the upcoming weekend. Now, sometimes with cold fronts, we get a chance of rain. In this situation, it doesn't look all that likely. Right now, we have some showers across the border and even just creeping into northwestern Valverde County. Most of the activity is in Mexico right now, and some of this very lit up here as well. There's the off chance that we could see some of this action make it across the border and even travel eastward before fizzling out right near I-35. I get to give it about a 20% chance that we could see the leftovers of any of that. But those of you along the Rio Grande here, you, you have maybe a 40 to 50% chance of some of that activity actually making it across and hitting you here in San Antonio, far less of a chance. And our upper level wind flow is actually going to uh, see a big change that's going to cause a big dip in the flow, giving us a little bit of a chance of rain by Wednesday. So 20% chance tomorrow, maybe a rogue storm popping up by Wednesday, about a 30% chance, but otherwise that's it. Look at this with the change in the weather pattern. We're not looking at any rain chances, at least not now for Thursday, all the way through the weekend and into early next week. We could use more rain. Odds are slim right now. So areas of fog tomorrow morning, low clouds. 71 in the morning, near 90 by the afternoon with some afternoon sunshine and just a off chance of a rogue storm popping up. We get into Wednesday, that cold front hits, so we'll see the humidity dropping throughout the day. It's going to be a gusty day as well with that north wind kicking in and a 30% chance of some isolated storms for the first part of the day. Thursday, Friday, look at those mornings in the 50s, afternoons, upper 80s, right around 90. Then the humidity returns as we get into the upcoming weekend. Already entering the month of May. Yes, Can't believe we are. It. All right. Thank you, Adam. In case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. The countdown is on. In just four days, all Texas restaurants, retail shops, malls, theaters can finally reopen. Governor Greg Abbott laying out his plans this afternoon on how they can go about it. With the first phase of reopening Texas safely beginning on Friday, our Stephanie Cerna talked to the owner of Chris Madrid's about what that means. Richard Peacock tells us that the timing of the governor's announcement was welcome and they plan on reopening in a responsible way while practicing social distancing. One rule of thumb, he says, is going to be that his employees will need to be comfortable with having their families and friends come to the restaurant on Friday first and then if they feel good about it, they will open. San Antonio police say they have received more than 1300 calls for social distancing related violations since the city's emergency declaration went into effect. The problem, some of those calls came in through 911, which should only be used for emergencies. We do have the non emergency number, which is 210207 SAPD, uh, which we would prefer people to utilize that number 
murdered. San Antonio police say a man was stabbed multiple times overnight south of downtown. Happened just after 11 in the 400 block of McKay Avenue. Police say they also found another stabbing victim just down the street near the intersection of Pressa and School Streets. The two were taken to the hospital. There's no word yet if police have any suspects. HEB is extending its hours starting today. All stores will now be open from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. The grocery chain had temporarily limited hours to help keep shelves stocked. Before we go, we have a quick update on that house fire on the northeast side that we told you about a little earlier in this newscast. Firefighters getting the call to the 12,800 block of Terrytown. We can report that there are no injuries in that fire, though as you can see there, the home did take some pretty heavy damage. Yeah, this is in the Valley Forge area, if you're familiar with the area. Firefighters say the couple inside the home along with the pet did make it out safely. We're told they heard popping noises when the fire started and got out before the flames spread through the house. About three quarters of the home was damaged, but the fire was contained to just that home. There are nearby homes that you see there. The cause of the fire is under investigation. Looks like we'll wake up to some low clouds, a little bit of fog tomorrow morning, 71 near 90 in the afternoon. The off chance of a rogue storm developing and even into Wednesday morning, we could see some isolated storms, but the humidity is really going to drop by Wednesday afternoon on through Thursday and Friday. Thank you, Adam, and thanks for watching the news at 6. See you online at 9 and on the night beat at 10.